So welcome everyone to the second lecture in the Humanities Research Center's Works That Shape the World series for 2022. Our guest today is Miles Pattenden. Before we, we begin, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Our speaker today is Miles Pattenden, who's a senior research fellow in medieval and early modern studies at the Australian Catholic University's Institute for Religion and Critical Inquiry in Melbourne. And this semester, he's a visiting fellow here at the ANU uh, Humanities Research Centre just down the corridor. His uh, books include Pius IV and the Fall of the Carafa, published by Oxford University Press in 2013, and Electing the Pope in Early Modern Italy, also published by Oxford in 2017. So this evening he's talking about Gaetano Moroni's 103 volume uh, Ecclesial Dictionary. And after the talk, I invite you to raise your hands if you want to ask a question directly to Miles, or you can use the chat function or the Q&A function to write a question and I can read that out to Miles. And that Q&A part of the lecture won't be recorded. So it's my pleasure to hand over now to, to Miles Pattenden of the Australian Catholic University. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. And uh, I hope I'm gonna work out how to correctly share my screen here. Um, can everybody see the, the PowerPoint? I'm going to take silence to mean yes there. So I'll, I'll start my lecture and start yes by thanking um, Ibrahim and in fact everybody who's hosted me here over the past uh, few weeks at ANU. It's been a wonderful time here and it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you again this evening in this series about religious works that have shaped the world. I'm really sorry we can't be doing this in person in one of the lecture rooms. I feel somewhat apprehensive in making my opening remarks uh, for compared to some of the other books I've seen discussed in this series, my chosen text is great, perhaps only in that most literal sense of, senses of the word. Yes, Caetano Moroni's Dizionario di Eridizione Storico Ecclesiastica may be the most significant, or perhaps I should say weighty, work of 19th century amateur scholarship that you've probably never heard of. Its 103 volumes were printed in Venice, between 1840 and 1861. Its index, which Moroni compiled a further two decades later, on its own comes to a further six volumes containing more than 3,000 pages. Moroni himself boasted that his dictionary housed 12,472 entries and that the index provided a further 120,650 references. No one has ever counted the number of words as far as I know. Overall, the sheer scale of Moroni's enterprise places it alongside the great French Enlightenment Encyclopédie, or indeed many dictionaries of national biography that are produced today. By way of contrast, Denis Diderot's Encyclopédie, published between, 18, sorry, between 1751 and 1772, is made up of just 28 volumes, though it does boast 71,818 articles. But remember that Moroni's work was all, or largely all, the result of just one man, a man with a phenomenal memory and thirst for knowledge. It might even have been enough to satisfy the ARC. Yet my contention in this lecture is that Moroni's dictionary is really significant as a work of religious scholarship on a global historical level, and one deserving of recognition in that context. I first came to it because as an early modern historian, I have often had to try to find obscure references to particular ecclesiastical phenomena, symbols, rituals, customs, spaces, etc. And my colleague Arno Witte, professor of art history at the University of Amsterdam, was the first to alert me to Moroni's potential when we were both graduate students. And since then, Moroni's pages have provided a rich seam of material for various projects. Most recently, Moroni has returned to the forefront of my mind in the context of a new but somewhat diffuse research project I'm developing about Catholic medievalisms. One strand of that has been to examine the ways in which the church's antiquarian historians in the 18th and 19th century in Italy imagined 
and wrote about the papal past. Moroni's text, even more than Ludwig Pasteur's, much better known 40 volume history uh, of the popes since the end of the Middle Ages, ought to be seen as the sine qua non of that literary genre. Certainly, analyzing Moroni will be an important component of the project as a whole. But as I stand before you today, I feel somewhat like Bart Simpson in that classic earlier season episode when he tries to review Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island on the basis of his real time scan of a blurb on the back of the text. I'm talking to you before I've read the whole of or even the majority of Moroni's dictionary. In fact, of course, it's probable, even likely, that I'll never actually read the whole thing, for there is always an opportunity cost to spending that much time on a single academic endeavor. And trust me, Morone is no Dante. I confess this because I want to inform you that what I present here are, as it were, my preliminary thoughts. This is the line of thinking which will drive my scholarship. And if it can persuade you to take an interest in Moroni and his dictionary, then so much the better. I don't promise you'll pick up any party tricks from it, but it's a work, perhaps in the context of 19th century historiography, the work that shaped the Catholic Church's perception of itself and it thus more than merits inclusion in this lecture series. Perhaps the place to begin with our discussion then is with Moroni himself, who he was and how he came to begin this monumental project in the first place. Perhaps surprisingly, given the expectations you might have, Moroni was not a Catholic priest, but a layman. Born in Rome on the 17th of October, 1802, he came from comparatively humble origins. His father was a barber and his family later owned two shops in the city. He showed great promise as a pupil at the school attached to the Paris of San Salvatore in Lauro, then run by the De La Salle brothers. Barber's work was still closely connected to that of surgeons in Italy in those days, and Caetano accompanied his uncle on visits to the Pilgrim Hospital of Santo Spirito, taking a particular interest in the practice of medicine. But it was through one of his father's most assiduous customers, however, that his big break came. This man was uh, Bartolomeo Alberto Capellari, also known as Mauro, the Vicar General of the Camaldoese Order. Capellari is a hugely important figure in 19th century history in his own right. Born into the minor nobility of Venice in 1765, he began to attract attention as an arch critic of the Jansenists and other liberals. His Triunfo della Santa Sede, and I'm sorry for having got the caption on the wrong slide there, The Triumph of the Holy See, published in 1799 in the wake of Pius VI's humiliating capture by Napoleon and subsequent death in a French prison, really put him on the map. Capellari remained a staunch opponent of the French emperor throughout the 19th century's first decade returning to Rome only after Pope Pius VII's restoration there in 1814. In 1825, he was made a cardinal and in 1826, prefect of the Congregation of the Propaganda Fide, the Catholic Church's ministry for missionary work. Most significantly, on the 2nd of February, 1831, he was unexpectedly chosen to succeed the short-lived Pius VIII as Pope. He took the name Gregory XVI, and was to rule Rome in what most historians regard as a harsh and uncompromising fashion for just over 15 years. Most famously, he banned bicycles and railways from the Papal States, but that's another story. This is Moroni's story, not Capillari's. Capillari's significance to Moroni is that he took the younger man in under his wing, behaving towards him as a patron. From around 1816, Capillari employed Moroni as a servant, secretary, major domo, even as his nurse. Their relationship survived Moroni's decision in 1824 to marry a young Roman woman, Clementina Verdesi, and was formalized after Capellari's promotion to the cardinalate, cardinalate the following year. Moroni became the elderly cardinal's chamberlain, and he and his wife moved into his palace, becoming something like a surrogate family. Of course, the nature of this menage a trois soon also became the subject of lampoon and satire, in large part thanks to the scurrilous humour of the earthy Roman poet Giuseppe Giacchino Belli. Belli's poems 
constantly insinuate a sexual relationship between Capellari and Clementina Maroni, and also that this was the basis of the favour in which she and her husband found themselves. In Un Antro Viaggio del Papa, another papal trip, Belli refers to Clementina crudely as La Putana Santissima, the holiest of whores. In Er Papa Uomo, the Pope as a man, he relates the existence of a secret passage which allowed the Pope access to the Moroni's apartment. In the Pope's palace, there's a garden with small woods and a small house in it, full of sofas and armchairs and bottles of wine. There's also a small room in the palace with a hidden door, which leads through a staircase to Gitanino's apartment. Gitanino is married and his wife is a woman very devoted to Christ's vicar. I don't want to say any more, these words could be misunderstood. I don't believe there's any real evidence for any of this. Capellari seems to have been drawn to Moroni because of what he perceived as his impressive work ethic and upstanding character. A better understanding of the relationship between Moroni and Capellari might therefore be to be to think of it as approximating that of the Pope with his cardinal nephew in earlier periods. Such nephews were often adopted in the 17th and 18th centuries, largely because adopted family proved more diligent and capable in assisting the elderly celibates who ran the Vatican than their actual blood relations, something they had in common with Roman emperors in earlier periods. And thus it was with Moroni too. Certainly, no one came to doubt his industry during Capillari's reign or after his death. How did Moroni come to write his dictionary? It seems to have been Capellari, by then Pope Gregory, who first gave Moroni the idea of publishing. The Pope himself had put him in contact with a Venetian publisher, Giuseppe Battaglia, whom Moroni was to persuade to republish Il Trionfo della Santa Sede in, 17, in 1832. The reprint was to be a celebration of Gregory's pontificate, which the new Pope no doubt wanted cast as the Holy See's most literal triumph. And Gregory also tried to sponsor revivals of some quite conservative strands in Catholic intellectual culture at this time, in part to take the fight to liberals like the French priest Felicité de Lamennais, who believed in things like separation of church and state. Gregory's most significant initiative in this was the resurrection from the dead of scholastic theology. But the sacred history the record of the church's role in shaping the Christian past was also fair game. In 1837, Moroni had Battaglia publish a piece of his own original work, a book entitled I Ceni Cronologici dello Sommo Pontificio Gregorio XVI, the Chronological Notes on the Supreme Pontiff Gregory XVI. The pair also seemed to have drawn up plans at this point for a 30 volume comprehensive work, which would collate and summarize all known information about subjects and topics of importance to the Catholic Church from St. Peter to the present day. Moroni worked on this project for up to 14 hours a day, reading all the material he could lay his hands on and encouraging the Pope to purchase more materials for the Vatican's collections to increase his source base. The Dizionario's first volume, the culmination of these initial efforts, appeared in 1840 and the next five also the following followed that year. By 1843, 23 volumes were complete. By 1846, the year of Gregory's death, there were 41, and production slowed only in the aftermath of the 1848 revolution in Rome. A three-year hiatus happened between volume 49 and four, volume, four, volume 50. The remaining volumes appeared at a steady pace throughout the 1850s, with the 100th appearing at the end of that decade and the 103rd and final one a year later. Six volumes of the index appeared somewhat later in 1878-9 after, after the end of Pope Pius IX's pontificate. The overall production run began at 3,000 copies per volume, although this was reduced to 2,500 later on to save on costs. Some volumes were also printed on lightweight India paper. This downsizing of ambitions reflected ultimately and unsurprisingly, the reality that the dictionary was no great money spinner for its author. A plaintive note sent by Moroni to Pope Leo XIII in 
in 1879, claimed his out of expense, sorry, his out of pocket expenses had totaled around 9,000 scudi. Part of the problem that Moroni had faced after 1846 seems to have been a certain indifference and perhaps even hostility from Gregory's pontifical successor, Pius IX. Pio Nonno, as he is known in Italian, a, late, a name later satirized as Pio No No by his many opponents, was a difficult man who lived in trying times. Gregory's pontificate, with its unflinching revanchism and reactionary fervor, had not necessarily worked out all that well, either for the papacy or the Pope's subjects. The papal states remained poor and backward and were getting more so. Pio Nonno had come in after his election determined to be a liberal and began well by reversing Gregory's railway ban. But the events of 1848, when he was forced to flee Rome in disguise at dead of night, set him on a different and ill-fated course. Either way, Pius seems to have resented Moroni, both because of his role in Gregory's administration and because the late Pope had settled a considerable sum of money on him, which the cash-strapped Camera Apostolica could ill afford at this point. As it happens, Pius was able to reclaim much of Gregory's legacy to Moroni, which explains much about why Moroni started to run out of money. The 9,000 scudi of debt he took on to complete his work was a substantial sum at a time when complete copies of the entire work retailed for around 125 scudi. And I know these figures will seem almost unimaginable to anyone with experience of spending thousands of lira to buy a coffee in the currency's day, dying days before euroization. Um, but uh, it, it is important to get these sums in perspective. The Dictionario's full title mentions that it describes, quote, the principal saints, blessed figures, martyrs, church fathers, etc., and in line with Pope Gregory's agenda, that Moroni seems originally to have conceived of it as a resource in the tradition of the various great ecclesiastical works of reference of the Tridentine period, that is, in the years after the Council of Trent met from 1545 to 63. Those Tridentine works, such as, for instance, Cesare Baronio's Annales Ecclesiastici, or Alfonso Chacon's Vitae et Res Gestae Sumorum Pontificum et Sanctae Romanae Ecclesiae Cardinalium, as the lives and deeds of the popes and cardinals, had been intended primarily as works that established the antiquity and therefore the authenticity of the Catholic Church's traditions. In particular, those of its traditions which had come under attack during the Reformation, namely the apostolic succession of bishops and the papal primacy. Yet Moroni's dictionary soon went much further than any of this existing literature. Its final version, offers a far more extensive list and variety of entries than any Catholic work of reference that had appeared hitherto. Moroni describes all manner of illustrious persons associated with the church in various ways, and not just the eminentissimi, that is popes, bishops, and cardinals. It also has long entries on opponents, such as Martin Luther and the Calvinists. It further provides entries on all manner of places from Egypt to the Yucatan, and on ecclesiastical paraphernalia from Aqua Santa, holy water, to the Tzimara, uh, a sort of ecclesiastical cassock. Some of my own current work concerns the history of ecclesiastical wig wearing. So let me use the entry on such parrucche, as wigs are called in Italian, as an example. Moroni, in fact, provides four pages on this topic, which start with the wig's origins in ancient Greece and outline opinions on fake hair amongst the church fathers in antiquity. Moroni then catalogues examples of the fashion for wigs which had arisen amongst ecclesiastics in parallel with similar developments in secular society from the mid 17th century. The various papal briefs and bulls restricting the use of wigs by priests from the time of Pope Innocent XII in the 1690s onwards are also set out in some detail. Scurrilous rumors that any popes themselves have ever worn wigs are rebuffed, as they, would have to, as they would have had to have been. The canon law on this subject was very clear. Clergy were not supposed to wear hair pieces, and doing so created liturgical difficulties during the mass. St. Paul in his, letter make, in his letters makes it clear that Christians 
must receive the gospel and consecrate the Eucharistic host with an uncovered head. The point here is that Moroni adopts a, def a, def a definitely, even defiantly ap apologetic tone. He makes a point of noting, for instance, how Pope Pius VI, a Pope who certainly did wear a wig, at least while he was still a cardinal, put his fake hair aside on his election, preferring instead to powder the real hair. This in turn started to fashion, Moroni admits, but he emphasizes how the Pope's motives in this instance were sanitary rather than cosmetic. It was to prevent, in the Italian, una certa spiacevole luridezza di testa, a certain unpleasant foulness of the head. What Moroni doesn't say is also notable here. He knew full well, for instance, about Pope Benedict XIV's lengthy juridical discussion of wig wearing amongst priests of the Archdiocese of Bologna, where he had been bishop in the 1730s. Yet Moroni somehow fails to include this, this, this information in his comprehensive catalogue. He certainly makes no mention of Benedict's admission to sometimes having worn a wig uh, in uh, his cold um, church. Such inclusions and omissions rather set the pattern. Moroni's text remains fantastically useful as a first port of call for obscure detail about medieval or early modern church rituals, persons or sacramentalia. But it also has to be treated gingerly as history, lest his agenda ends up driving our research rather than merely serving it as a useful resource. Why then does Moroni's dictionary matter? The reason I picked it for this lecture is that I wanted to make a case for it as a work that shaped the world, or at least the understanding of what religious historians can do. That is, after all, the purpose of this series, so how does it do that? At the most literal level, Moroni's contribution is obvious. It was by some distance the greatest compendium of knowledge about what we might term the broad culture of the Catholic Church uh, collected together at that date. It applied those techniques developed, sorry, I've, uh, it divide, developed those techniques applied, developed by the uh, French encyclopedist of the 18th century to the ecclesiastical sphere. And in so doing, it broadened the definition of what counted as a suitable subject for scholarly discussion in that arena. I think the majority of historians and art historians who make recourse to Moroni's dictionary today would acknowledge readily and generously the significance of its author's contribution in this respect. But in the second half of this lecture, I want to make a further argument that Moroni's work represented an important milestone in the development of historiography, that is writing about history at a broader level. A lot of undergraduates uh, have to study what we might term a historiography 101 course at different universities around the world, and they often get set great books um, which have changed how historians think about or write about the past. The Oxford one, which I taught for many years, was a product of Hugh Trevor Roper's design. This man on the screen is Hugh Trevor Roper, not an, uh, not a, an Enlightenment uh, philosopher, as I was expecting in my slideshow. But Trevor Roper's design starts with Tacitus, then Augustine, then Machiavelli, and on to Ranker, Macaulay, Marx, and Max Weber. My point here is that Trevor Roper's conception of historiography's history is somewhat narrow and overlooks the importance of ecclesiastical traditions of sacred history, such as Moroni's. Surprising from Archbishop Lord's, sorry, surprising from Archbishop Lord's great biographer, you might think. However, I think it still reflects a certain prejudice within the profession that we might that we want to think of ourselves as coming out of professional environments like the 19th century German university, not the Vatican. The contribution of church historians has therefore always sat uneasily with how professional university-based historians want to see ourselves. Some scholars, notably the great Princeton professor Anthony Grafton, and also more recently the German Stefan Bauer via his grandiloquently entitled Invention of Papal History, have made considerable advances in explaining the role that clergy and their agenda played in establishing what we now recognize to have been professional norms. As I mentioned before, those counter-reformation clerics like Cesare Baronio and, Alfo and Alfonso Chacon were, re were researching and writing essentially to prove that their version of Christianity was truer and more legitimate than the critiques of it proposed by Protestant reformers. 
Nevertheless, Baroni and Chacon's ideas about such subjects as source criticism and how to present information to readers to generate an apparatus for scholarly discourse went mainstream, partly through men like Edward Gibbon and also through the writers of the French and German Enlightenments. Leopold von Hanke, the father, of the father figure of modern historiography, is usually treated as the end point of that story and the fonds et origo of the new one of history as a profession. Yet 19th century historiography had other paths besides the one which ran through German Protestant universities. Moroni's path, though now unfashionable because of its associations with what we now see as a cringeworthy Catholic apologetic, was nevertheless significant and deserves some recognition. Crucially, Moroni did not undertake his monumental enterprise in a vacuum, but rather as a project which built on well-established traditions in the writing of history in late papal Rome. These traditions had themselves in turn developed from the sorts of things Baronio and Chacon had been writing those two centuries earlier. But I want to dwell on them as context to Moroni's work, partly because they help explain something of what his original contribution to historical scholarship was. Some of my recent research has been engaging with what we might term a key moment in Italian and Catholic Italian historiography, when long-standing traditions of sacred history, that is the writing about the church and its traditions, began to fuse with other strands of antiquarianism, that is the study of the material culture of the past. This fusion wasn't completely unique to Rome, but it was in Rome that one of its crucial developments occurred in a particular generation around the turn of the 19th century in the aftermath of revolution. The impact of the French Revolution on Rome and on the papacy, including on the papacy's perception of itself and on others' perceptions of it, can scarcely be overstated. Events in France not only profoundly shocked Pius VI and all his clergy, but eventually dispossessed the aging Pope of both his patrimony and his liberty. A Roman Republic was set up in 1798 after Napoleon's general, Louis Alexandre Berthier, escorted Pius into his French captivity. The Republic did not last long, but psychologically, it was devastating for many of those who had been invested in the old clerical regime. Everything had been swept away by Napoleon's men, from the statues in churches to their sacred bells. Even the calendar and the hours of the day had been done away with in favor of more egalitarian, less Christian methods of timekeeping. Pius VII's restoration, which happened in 1800, therefore involved an extremely concerted effort towards what the Italian scholar Marina Caffiero has termed a resacralization, that is the expunging of polluted Republican symbols, which had been brought into civic life over the previous two years and the resurrection of the older religious ones. That process inspired a whole generation of Catholic historians, most of them men of letters, clerics in minor orders rather than priests, who looked both at Rome's material culture in the present and at how they could ground it in the past as a means to resacralize. A man called Francesco Cancellieri, uh, who was in many ways Moroni's prime forerunner, was a key figure in all this. Younger Italian patriots thought Moroni a fusty old boar. Witness these two descriptions of him, one by the poet Giacomo Lepardi, who called him, quote, an old fool, a river of chatter, the most tiresome and insupportable boar on earth, and another um, by uh, Giuseppe Giacchino Belli, whom we met earlier, making fun of Clementina Moroni, who penned the irreverent observation on Cancellieri that he was the sort of man who began talking to you about radishes, then about carrots in the radish, then about aubergines in the carrot, and ended only with the fall of Troy. On one level, of course, these men are absolutely right. Cancellieri's books are fantastically dull, but that doesn't mean that they're not important and innovative. Cancellieri's great gift was to find ways which connected the past and the present. Take, for instance, his study of the bells of the Capitoline Palace, which I've written about for the journal Modern Italy. These bells had been melted down for coin in 1799, but were recast in 1805 with a gift of bronze from Pius VII. But Cancellieri's book on the bells is not really about the bells at all. 
Rather, it is a story of how bells should matter to Italians and to Catholics. It is a catalogue of how the old bells were used that provides guidance to those charged with ringing the new bells, and just as importantly, to those who will hear the bells. Cancellieri's main audience is essentially those whom he wishes to educate in what the sound of those bells should mean when they hear it. By educating them, he hoped to bring them back into communion with past generations of Romans who had been hearing these bells since the 13th century. Perhaps he was inspired by a French joke which was doing the rounds just before the revolution. Two Frenchmen look for each other in a large crowd in Italy. and One finds, one finds the other only when the Italians all kneel down in prayer at the Angelus bell. What then did Moroni specifically add to all this? Cancellieri's was a propagandist effort aimed at recreating a lost sense of community in Rome, but it was innovative in that it scoured not just Rome's ancient past, either pagan or Christian, but its contemporary concerns and indeed its latest civic projects. This was in a sense a forerunner of what Moroni was trying to do, but on a much larger scale. And crucially, Cancellieri's work reflects a somewhat more positive less defensive view of papal authority and Rome's past than the reactionary attitudes which were to follow later and indeed dominate when Pope Pius IX was threatened by the Italian state in the Risorgimento in the 1860s. Moroni's work, in spite of the author's general deference to Pope Gregory, is often in this same vein. It describes the rituals and material culture of Catholicism in ways that sought to build community, just as Cancellieri's writings did. Moreover, Thanks to his privileged position as Gregory's right-hand man, Moroni was able to amass a considerable body of materials to support his enterprise. The Italian scholar Nelovian has written of Moroni's bibliophilia and its important effects on the development of the Vatican's library collections. Moroni encouraged Gregory to make large purchases of books when available, and lots were available in the aftermath of the revolutionary era. In 1839, for instance, Gregory bought 24,000 volumes from French libraries. Moroni also persuaded Gregory to buy a 21 volume set of the Roman engravings uh, of the 18th century artist Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Again, we can see such acquisitions as this to have been part of a program to foster a shared sense of Roman cultural heritage, which was built around papal patronage. Yet Moroni also went further than Cancellieri. His work specifically organized knowledge according to the Pope's centrality to human affairs. It also defended the Pope's primacy as Bishop of Rome and all other powers descended from it and descending from it depended on him. Thus histories of individual dioceses are retold from the Roman perspectives, the, pr the privileges that Popes had granted to them and so on. Individual persons are likewise written about in relation to the work that they did in Rome or for Rome or how Rome helped them in their careers. The whole thing was clearly conceived as something in the honor, glory and defense of God and the Holy See, of the ecclesiastical hierarchy of Rome and of Italy, as well as of good morals, as Enrico Croci, an Italian who wrote about this after the Second World War has noted. This has generally been viewed as a very bad thing by historians. As I mentioned before, it makes Moroni's work seem an, un an unashamed apologetic in which ideological concerns trump objective ones. And largely because of that, Moroni's scholarship went out of fashion. And the fact that he's such an obvious amateur in an age when historians began to professionalize didn't help much either. We might contrast his standing not with Cancellieri, who also has suffered from a similar disregard, um, but therefore with another contemporary Catholic historian, the German Ignaz von Döllinger. Döllinger, a, a disciple of the Protestant Ranke in many respects, seems to provide the forward-looking side to Catholic historiography in these years. His works offered rigorous source critiques of the historically dubious documents on which papal claims to primacy were ultimately based. His 1863 work, Fables of the Popes in the Middle Ages, and the clue there is really in the title, presents a somewhat different take on the history of Catholicism uh, than Moroni's does. And Dörlinger fam was famously excommunicated by the Archbishop of Munich, Gregor von Scher, in 1871, after he publicly refused to accept the doctrine of the Pope's infallibility, 
which had recently been endorsed by the First Vatican Council. Even The Guardian wrote about this at the time and labelled him as a free speech martyr. Indeed, Berlinger, the martyr to reason, has provided an acceptably sceptical face for Catholic historiography to the wider profession ever since, whereas Moroni, with his personal devotion to Gregory XVI and his obvious pro-papal agenda, is easily branded as the opposite. So what value is there then in Moroni's work for us today? Part of my interest in Moroni has been to think about how we might reappraise him so we can acknowledge his, apologet his, his apologeticism, but also, rather than using it as an excuse to cancel him, think about how it means he fitted into the history of wider historical practice. After all, for all that we hold up Dullinger and Ranker as the great exemplars of forward-thinking 19th century historiography, historians ourselves have moved on a long way from Ranker's famous dictum that we must write history as it actually was. We recognize the subjectivity biases in our own perspectives, as well as in our own sources. We acknowledge how our own circumstances and the zeitgeist shape both the sorts of questions we ask and the answers that we seek. Thus it was with Moroni, a man of his times, a man who lived in a failing state in its death throes, a gerontocracy of celibate clerics, the very antithesis of the modern, although contemporary Italy has successfully preserved the gerontocratic part. Moroni did, have, did not have much of a gift for synthesis, uh, nor uh, much literary flair or fluency. He worked on the basis of sheer discovery of material, so each page looks like a mass of digressions which pull together highly disparate strands. He is therefore not important as a stylist, like say a Macaulay or a Gibbon either. Nevertheless, somehow reading Moroni's work, it feels more modern today than either Ranker or Dullinger does, or indeed perhaps Gibbon or Macaulay, whose English, though beautiful, is a touch antique. It comes down to a point that I started with, with respect to Moroni and Cancellieri. Their much broader conception of what constituted a suitable subject for historical discussion has stood the test of time better. In an age in which we're interested in social history and cultural history and in the meaning of objects, Moroni's work is proving invaluable. Where else, for instance, could you find such a comprehensive discussion of the ecclesiastical wig? Or if they're not your thing, chapels, conclaves, councils, feast days, liturgical vestments, sacramentals, saints, martyrs, and so on. The lack of critical apparatus which used to make it quite hard to consult Moroni's work in spite of its six volume index, isn't much of an issue in the age of Google. Moroni's is in some ways a work of digital humanities avant la lettre. We might think of it as a database uh, um, with, with qualities that prefigure the ways in which many of us now collate material to work on uh, later in pursuit of specific studies. Moroni's is the kind of project that would have impressed a research grant funding body. And I mean that positively rather than as a damnation with faint praise. And in a way, that's exactly what it was if you count Pope Gregory and his church as such an organization. Moroni's dictionary has everything you secretly wanted to know about the Catholic church, but were too afraid to ask in it. So go and explore it through the modern magic of Google Translate. Thank you very much. <laughs>